Father, thank you for bringing us here today. God, thank you for uh, just letting it be another day to worship you. God, we had a, a long week or a short week. God, it was, um, you're always trying to teach us something. So, Father, as we continue to worship, I pray that you come and meet us here in this place. Father, let us lay down all the, the junk and stuff we bring in and the, the things we try to carry around on our, on our own. God, I hope we can lay it down here. Father, forgive us for the where we failed you this week. Father, and embolden us to be vessels for you and just purify our lips and let it be a, a sweet time of worship for you, God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. tell you today um, I hope you came here and I hope that your heart is ready to receive turn to Titus chapter 2 we have got such a powerful portion of scripture this morning and I hope that it's presented in a way that just really helps you be able to understand it but but to live in it so two cross references I need you to mark Genesis 6 and then John 14 we'll be covering a lot of ground this morning and we're going to change things up. So I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to read our text right off the bat. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 through 15. God willing we will finish the second chapter of Titus today but up on the screen we have our text. Let's read this loud and bold where Paul says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort, and rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you. Let's pray over this. Father, what a powerful portion of scripture. What a great day to send off a mission team, Lord, that they can carry this message that we're gonna study this morning. We pray, Father, for our own hearts. It's easy to walk in here and just go through the motions because it's Sunday and we do church on Sunday, but right now, Lord, I pray that by your spirit, you would just stir us Lord, that your word would speak so clearly without distraction and with power. And that today, Lord, we would experience the truths that lead us to genuine transformation in Christ. And to that end, we pray, Lord, now come be our teacher in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so you know this, that for the past five months, we've been studying through that portion of the New Testament that we call the pastoral epistles. We have three books, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And these three books 
were written by the Apostle Paul to two young pastors who were pastoring what we would call struggling churches. And they were both struggling to do what they were called to do. So Paul leaves Titus on the island of Crete, and he goes on probably to Macedonia, and then a little bit later he writes this book to instruct and to encourage him. And so last week, we came to a major turning point in the book of Titus when we began chapter 2. And this is what many Bible scholars refer to as the most powerful portion of Scripture relating to cultivating a healthy church. And obviously, as a pastor, I want to do everything I can to cultivate a healthy church. So studying these things in depth is really important to me. So our text today is Titus 2, 11 through 15. Our message title, part two of cultivating a healthy church is titled Saved, Transformed, and Sustained by Grace. And today we are going to be talking about the grace of God. And you'll remember that in chapter one, Paul corrected a lot of bad behavior at the church's on the island of Crete, but here in chapter 2, his focus is different. He's no longer correcting bad behavior. What he's do, doing is he's instructing Titus on the things he needs to do in order to cultivate a healthy church. So there's really no more confronting. From this point, it's really building. And so because today is part 2 of this section in chapters 2 and 3, our review is really important. So we're going to take a few minutes and we're just going to talk about how we got where we are today. So let's remind ourselves of the key verse in the book of Titus. Look back at chapter 1. It'll be up on the screen as well. But Titus in chapter 1.1, 1, 1, at the end of the verse, he refers to the truth which accords with godliness. And in a sense, what Titus is being instructed is that a genuine believer is going to allow his beliefs to impact his behavior. What we believe is supposed to impact how we live. And if we have the truth of Scripture, our life is supposed to have a very specific look to it. Well, there were some problems at Crete because the believers in these Cretan churches were under the influence of false teachers and so in a sense, they were allowing their beliefs to impact their behavior, but their beliefs were wrong. And you had two primary groups of false teachers in the churches at Crete. And you had the first who were basically telling the church, once you're saved by grace, you can do anything you want. So look up at the screen. I, I've got two mindsets that we have to address this morning. And the first is that mindset within the church that, hey, I'm saved by grace, so I can do anything. Have you ever talked to a Christian that lives that way? Hey, man, Christians aren't supposed to do that. I mean, it's right here in the Word. Don't judge me, brother. Saved by grace. I can do anything I want. I'm free in Christ, right? But that doesn't mean free to sin or free to live any way we want. And, and this was actually going on at Crete. And then there was the second mindset, and what, what happened is that this was a group of people trying to respond to this mindset. And so they came and they imposed a lot of rules-based righteousness upon the believers there in Crete. They, they were Judaizers, Jewish people from Jerusalem who imposed the Jewish law. So the mindset in the second group, notice up on the screen, they were taught, I'm saved by grace, but I'm transformed into the image of Jesus by obeying the law of Moses. And so they had this Jesus plus mentality. And the problem is that both of those positions came from a misunderstanding and a misapplication of the subject of the grace of God. And we see this in the church today. You got those who misunderstand God's grace and it's, I can do anything because I'm saved. And then the other group who misunderstands God's grace, who says, yes, I'm saved by grace, but transformation comes by keeping the rules. And Paul today is going to tell us both of those are wrong. So what he does, and, and I just, I got to tell you this, I, I love this text. 
because it is so empowering for you and I on how to live the Christian life. Paul basically says, Titus, what I'm going to do is I am going to give you an in-depth theological treatise on the subject of God's grace. And when you're done here, Titus, you're going to be able to teach the church how to have a balanced view of God's grace. So one more part of our review here. In our study last week, Paul... I'm trying to think of how to word this because I already told you he's not correcting anymore. Instructed, <laughs> if I can. Paul instructed and he said, listen, our great God and Savior Jesus has saved us. And then I think Paul realizes, I don't think everybody understands what that means. And so look down at your text, verse 11 here. Paul begins with the word for. And it's a transition word. It tells us that what we're going to study today is built upon what we closed with last week. So if you would, Paul gave us a negative and a positive element in last week's study. Looking back at verse 5 of chapter 2, he says that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So we were reminded last week that when a professing believer lives like a non-believer, they destroy the reputation of God and they destroy the reputation of Christianity. Because we're basically saying God doesn't change people. He may save people, but he doesn't change people. And then there is the positive element, chapter 2, verse 10. Paul says that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And Paul is saying here that believers who live out their faith, they exalt the finished work of Jesus. They exalt the character of God our Father by showing the world that I'm different than I was before I became a Christian. My life has been completely transformed. They draw attention to God's transforming power. So here's this dichotomy within the church, and I'm going to create a question here I want to throw at you. Why is it that two people can read the same Bible and they can attend the same church, they can listen to the same teaching, and they can fellowship with the same group of people? One person is continually growing in Christ and their life is radically transformed while the other person remains completely unchanged. Why is that? And Paul says, it's because of a misunderstanding and a misapplication of the grace of God. And if you study through the New Testament, you get to the book of Acts and you start looking at the life of the Apostle Paul. He had one message and it was the grace of God. You get to Romans, the grace of God. You get into the other epistles. You get into Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians. And you know what he talks about continually? The grace of God. It was Paul's favorite subject, in my opinion. And so many people have this distorted understanding of what God's grace is. They have a distorted understanding of how it applies to our lives. So we're going to spend our morning digging into what Paul says about the grace of God here in Titus. So let's begin by looking at verses 11 and 14. And then we're also going to look at Genesis 6. And we're going to ask the question, what is the grace of God? Let's talk about what the grace of God is. And so when we're talking about biblical grace, we're normally referring to the New Testament Greek word charis. And it is defined as getting what we don't deserve. Most people, if you ask them what grace is, they'll say grace is getting what you don't deserve. So Jesus saved me, I didn't deserve that, and so I'm under his grace. But when you look at everything that the Bible teaches about the grace of God and how it operates in our life, you see that there is so much more to it than just getting what I don't deserve. I found this definition of grace that I want to share with you. The grace of God is the merciful kindness by which God exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to saving faith in Christ. 
After that, he keeps, strengthens, and increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, and affections, or that word would be love in our modern day, to the end that they would exercise Christian virtues. So let's break this in half, and and let me add a little bit here. The first part of the definition talks to us about what we would call the saving grace of God. Let me read that to you again. The merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to saving faith in Christ. So the saving grace of God is the grace of God which delivers us from the eternal penalty of our sin. It's where we respond to the gospel and we're given this confidence that I will never have to pay the eternal penalty for my sin because Jesus bore that on the cross. But look at the second half of this definition. This is where the author says, after that he keeps, strengthens, and increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, and affections, or love, to the end that they would exercise Christian virtues. We would call this the transforming or the training grace of of God. And this is the grace of God which delivers us from the daily power of sin, and it enables us to effectively live out our faith. And one of the problems in the churches at Crete was that a lot of the people had experienced the saving grace of God, and for them that's where it ended. They hadn't gone on to experience the training grace of God, where the grace of God begins to work into us the character of Christ and work out of us the sinful nature that we all struggle with. So in order to understand, again, biblical grace, I really want everybody to walk out of here today and go, I get it. I finally get it. I want to take you to Genesis 6. So turn in your Bible to Genesis 6. And and this is the first place that the English word translated grace appears in the Bible. This is, of course, the Hebrew word word, which is hard to pronounce. It's chen. But I want to give you the word picture, the story that makes us understand God's grace. And so let's all turn to Genesis chapter 6. You guys all know the story. It's the story of Noah. The world has become so wicked at this point. So in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, Notice what Moses writes here. He says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. So what I want you to see here is we're building into what grace is, is that the entire human race, mankind, had so thoroughly rebelled against God that God says, I have no choice but to be true to my character and to who I am. I must now judge the human race for their wickedness and for their sin. Yet, jump ahead now to verse 8. And notice what it says here. It says, but... Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why Noah? Why is it that when the whole world is about to be judged by this righteous God, that one man is chosen to receive God's grace? Now, this is important, something I'm going to tell you right now. We need to understand that Moses wrote this Looking back, he knew the whole story. By faith, when the judgment of God was coming upon the land, Noah chose to listen to God's word and to build an ark, and that when the judgment started, he took he and those who believed, and they got in the ark. You see, God created an escape plan For anybody who would take that escape plan and apply it to their lives. In the Old Testament, in Genesis 6, it was building an ark and then getting in the ark. That was putting faith in God's plan to be saved during a time 
of judgment. And when judgment came, Noah and the rest of his family, eight in total, were found inside the ark, or you could say they were in the grace of God. And when judgment came, they were spared when the rest of the world was not spared. And so the grace of God revealed in Noah's day was an ark. And the grace of God allowed Noah to escape this judgment that came upon the earth. Now turn back to, sec- or to Titus, and this is where it gets really interesting. Titus 2 Paul is saying that because of our sin, mankind still faces God's righteous wrath. The wrath of God is coming upon the entire human race. But here in Titus 2, Paul tells Titus that true to his nature, God has revealed an escape plan to us. And this time it's not an ark. Titus 2.11, notice it says, The grace of God has appeared to all men. During Noah's time, the grace of God appeared as an ark. During our time, God's grace appeared in the form of his son, Jesus, who 2,000 years ago, the Christmas story, he came and he appeared. He took on flesh and he came and he lived among us. And this word appeared is so interesting. It only appears, isn't that interesting? The word appears only appears about six times in the entire New Testament, but it's the Greek word Epiphany or epiphaneus, different forms of the same word. And this word was often used in ancient Greek literature to describe a hero that arrived just in the nick of time to rescue someone who was in peril. I love that Paul chose that word because in just the nick of time, as mankind was at the high water mark of sin, the Father sent Jesus into the world. He appeared as a man to come to be our escape plan, to escape the wrath of of God. And that's exactly what Paul is telling us here in verse 14. And as we look closely down at verse 14, we're going to see the two elements of God's grace. In verse 14, Paul says, Jesus gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. That's the saving grace of God. Jesus died in our place so that he could offer us salvation from the eternal penalty of sin. But notice he goes on and he says, and to purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works, Paul goes on to talk about the transforming grace of God. That after we're saved, the grace of God is still working in us to deliver us from the daily power of sin. So having said that, we've talked about what grace is. Let's move on. We're going to look at verses 11 through 13 in depth now, and we're going to talk about what the grace of God does. What does the grace of God do in our lives? And look now, if you would, at verse 11. Paul says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you're tuning in and you're tracking with me, you probably notice that in these three verses, we see three elements of God's grace. We see the saving grace of God. We see the training grace of God. And we see the sustaining grace of God. And I want to go over that with you. So... Beginning in verse 11, the first thing that grace accomplishes in our life, and these have to take place in order, is found in verse 11 where Paul says the grace of God brings salvation. And again, I'm trying to drill this into your mind, so I'm repeating things again and again and again this morning. This is the saving grace of God, and it is step one of having a relationship with God. And so to think of the whole gospel story Each and every one of us, every person who has ever been born from Adam and Eve forward, were born under the curse of original sin. Adam and Eve sinned. Two sinners got together, had children. Right down to us, we have inherited the curse of original sin. But when a sinner hears the gospel and they put their faith in Jesus, 
they experience the first thing that God's grace does when they are delivered from the eternal penalty of their sin. We hear the gospel, we confess our sin, we repent of our sin, we receive Christ's righteousness as a free gift to us. We give him our sin in exchange. And the father looks at us and he says, the first thing I want you to know is you have been delivered from the eternal penalty of your sin. It was placed on Christ. You never have to worry about going into eternity and trying to convince me to let you into heaven. Your your ticket is bought by Jesus. It belongs to you. The eternal penalty of your sin is gone. And I want you to notice how Paul says it happened. It, It says in verse 14 that Jesus redeemed us from every lawless deed. Our lawless deeds made us slaves to sin. And so that word redeemed is so important. It's a theological idea that he paid a price to free us from the slave market of sin. And he willingly paid the price for our sin on the cross. And anybody, he promises, anybody that asks for the free gift of salvation, if they confess their sin and they're willing to repent, they receive that free gift of salvation. So I have to start with a question. And it's personal. It's not generic. This is your name here, okay? So say it, my name here. Okay, good. Have you, your name here, received the forgiveness of your sin and deliverance from the eternal penalty of your your sins through the grace of God? If yes, you know it, because you heard the gospel and you came to Christ and you said, listen, I've tried religion, I've tried good works, I've tried everything to please God. Nothing works but faith in your finished work. Jesus, I need you, you're my savior. I hope that everybody in the room has done that, but if not, why not ask for it right now? Why not just seal that right now and know that you have been forgiven from the eternal penalty of your sin? That is such a huge gift from the Lord. And let's just, let's just say that someone stood up right now and they're like, Pastor Randy, I want to get saved. And we just stopped and we prayed for that person and they got saved. Wouldn't that be exciting right now? But, but listen, I want to tell you, as exciting as that is, that person is in the most dangerous place they've probably ever been in their life. Because what if they walk out of Calvary Chapel Greer right now and they just think, wow, that's it. That's all I ever need to do. They're going to be that first mindset that, hey, I'm saved and I can go do anything I want now because I'm saved by the grace of God. And there's a lot of people in the church who are in that place right now where they think that Praying to receive Christ is the finish line of their spiritual race. But the Bible teaches that it is the starting line of their spiritual race. Instead of saying, finally, that's over, they can say, okay, I've entered the race, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, but now I'm going to spend the rest of my life under the second form of God's grace, which is his training grace, his transforming grace. And the reason that Christians don't change is because they think that that moment of salvation is the finish line. All right, I'm saved. I don't got to do nothing else. Just got to wait for the rapture of the church, right? Sometimes I wait at the bar. In fact, I spent a couple of years waiting in prison after I got caught dealing drugs. But I prayed over every bag of dope that I sold that the people would be blessed, you know. And I know that's extreme. I like to use these extreme ideas, but... But that's really how a lot of Christians think. Well, I'm saved. I can go do anything I want. So Paul brings us now to the second thing that God's grace does in our lives. It's found in verse 12. And Paul says here, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now he says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Now Paul moves on from saving grace to what we could call training grace or transforming grace. I like the word training because if you look up at the screen, are they still working? Praise Jesus, our screens are still working. The Greek word for teaches, where he says the grace of God teaches us, it's the Greek word paiduo, hard word to pronounce. It's used three ways in the New Testament. It it describes the training of children by parents. And it's a perfect analogy because when a person gets saved, he now 
becomes a spiritual child of our Heavenly Father. And our Heavenly Father, through the Holy Spirit, has to begin training that child. It's used a second time to support that first idea to describe to chastise with words. And so newly saved people come to church and, and they read their Bible and they get chastised. They, they read and they go, hey, I'm doing that, but the Bible says not to do that. They get corrected by the word of God. And if they respond to that, then the word of God is the tool by which God's grace is training that new believer. The Holy Spirit is revealing the word and that new believer is growing. And that's where it stops. But this word is also used to describe to chastise with blows. And the idea here is that if a person doesn't respond to his father's words, hey, stop that, son, stop that, then what does the parent have to do? He, he has to apply the Board of Education to the seat of learning, right? The idea is that our Heavenly Father, when we don't respond to the training of His Word, He has to use discipline. For, for children, we spanked our children. Not everybody spanks anymore. But we spanked our children. Here, Paul tells us, when you're training a child, if they don't respond to your words, then Paul says they need to respond to the spanking. He says when you don't respond to to God's word as a newly born again person. It's your choice, but God is still going to continue training you. He's just going to use another method. And that's why a lot of believers are like, man, why is my life always such a mess? I look at other believers and it just seems like their life is peaceful and everything's good. And me, it just seems like I'm always having run-ins with the cops and my boss is always mad at me and my wife's always figuring out what I'm actually doing when I tell her I'm going golfing. And How come God's not blessing me? Because you're not obeying God's word. And so God is having to come and he's having to use the policeman or your boss who says, I'm sorry, you can't work here anymore. Or a judge or maybe the Holy Spirit or maybe a circumstance that you're saying, why has God allowed this? And it very well could be that he is giving you chastisement through discipline. Now let's look a little closer at Verse 14, because this is the key to understanding God's training grace in our life. Notice Paul says that part of this training grace, God is purifying for himself his own special people who are zealous for good works. Two things. When you were not a believer, were you zealous for bad works like I was? I was pretty zealous for my sin. I was pretty zealous for the things that I wanted to do that I knew were sinful and wrong, Once you get saved, God begins to give you a zeal for the good works, which is not only just being good, but expanding his kingdom, serving in ministry, going to Romania on a mission trip or whatever God has. But I really want to hone in on a couple of words here because Paul is talking about the training grace, and he says that God purifies for himself his own special people zealous for good works. What really sticks out in those words to me is that you don't purify yourself when you become a Christian. What you do is you open yourself up to the purifying work of the Holy Spirit through the Word and through the body and through circumstances. You don't look in the mirror one day and go, you know what, I'm, I'm going to start a program to be a better version of myself. Have you ever done that? How'd that go for you? Yeah. I'm going to be a better version of this failure that I've always been. It it doesn't work. But when you go to the Father and you say, hey, as I'm being trained by grace, you are purifying me for you. Instead of me being able to come in here and brag and say, you know, I used to smoke seven packs of cigarettes a day. And I used to this and I used to that. And I killed a few people. And, you know, and then I can go, But you know what? I bought a book, How to Be a Better Version of You. And I'm only killing people like every other week now. And I'm down to three packs of cigarettes a day. And, you know, I'm only drinking on days of the week that have a Y at the end of it. I don't know, you know. Because we try to clean ourselves up. But Paul says, listen, 
when you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you and you say, hey, I want to be transformed by your training grace, Paul says the Holy Spirit transforms you from the inside out. And so going back to what was going on there in Crete, let's look at a couple of things in verse 14 that are not associated with training grace. There in verse 14, you see no mention of a rules-based program to help us overcome sin. In other words, we don't post rules in the church here to say, okay, this is how we overcome sin and just follow these seven steps, nine steps, you know, whatever, you're going to be better. Paul says, no, it's, it's about God's training grace. And then notice verse 14, there's also no mention of this licentiousness that was going on in the new believers at Crete where they basically said, hey, we're saved and now we subscribe to an anything goes lifestyle. And Paul says, no, those things aren't present. Instead, we see here in this verse that the grace of God trains us to overcome the daily power of sin and that power that sin has over us. So two ways that the grace of God trains us, if you would look here, the grace of God teaches us to put off our old sinful patterns. Verse 12, look at your Bible. Paul says, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. It is an unfortunate thing. I wish I could tell you that it's not this way, but it is this way that even though you and I are saved, we are still going to struggle with our flesh nature till the day we die, right? And sometimes our struggles, we're doing well, and sometimes we are losing the battle. But Paul says here that it's the grace of God that empowers us to actually deny ungodliness. Look at the other word he uses. We deny ungodliness. We also deny worldly lusts. So it, it's not that thing where you say, I'm going to do better. When you're struggling, we have to come to the Lord and say, God, I need more of your grace to be able to say no to this sin that I keep saying yes to. And God says, that's my job. I will help you with that. But notice the second thing. He says that the grace of God teaches us to put on these new Christ-like patterns. Verse 12, that we should live soberly. That means self-controlled. That we should live righteously. That means in a right relationship with other human beings. And we should live godly, which means we are in a right relationship with God in this present age. We live in the church age. We live in the age of grace. And the world around us, if you're paying attention is spinning out of control because of sinfulness. And if you believe like I do, there is a lot more demonic activity today than we have ever seen in the world. Satan knows his time is short and he is playing every card in his hand. Did that work? Every play in his playbook, I don't know. Paul says we live in this present age, this dark, dark age. And some of us, we're kind of worn out by what's going on. And Paul just says, listen, it's the grace of God that teaches us to continue soberly, self-controlled, righteously. We can be in a right relationship with others, even if they don't see eye to eye to us, because we are self-controlled and we're patient and we persevere. And then he says, and godly, we can continue to be in a right relationship with God because of his transforming or training grace. So we're learning today that there's so much more to grace than just getting what we don't deserve. Let's go on. I'm going to ask another question here. This is another your name here, okay? Are you currently experiencing the grace of God in a way that results in your old nature disappearing and the character of Jesus Christ being revealed in you in a growing way? And I hope the answer to that is yes. I hope you can look back six months and say, I have grown in Christ because of the work of God's grace. I hope you can look back a year and go, wow, I've really grown a lot in the last year. Looking back five years, you can say, I'm a completely different person. I hope that that's the answer for everybody. But if you're here and you're saying, PR, I'm, I'm like those people at Crete I don't have their same mindset where I think I can do anything I want because I'm saved by grace. I know that's wrong. But the truth of the matter is that I'm saved by grace and I continue to do all of the wrong things. I continue to live according to my flesh. 
and not according to the Spirit. Paul is telling you today, it, it could just simply be because you have never gone before the Holy Spirit and said, will you make me aware of your training grace? Help me to be focused when you are working in my life so that I don't say, man, the devil is really beating on me today. Rather, I can say the Holy Spirit is training me to say no to sin and to say yes to righteousness. A lot of Christians live apart from victory in Christ because they don't recognize that the Holy Spirit is using God's grace to train us. So often people are saying, man, the devil's really working in my life. And we're crediting the devil with something that the Holy Spirit is doing when the Holy Spirit is trying to train us by God's grace. So what's the answer to that question? Is your old nature disappearing? Is the character of Christ being revealed in you? If so, just keep doing the same things. God is going to continue working. If not, you cannot keep doing the things you're doing and thinking that you're going to grow in Christ. You've got to go back to the Word and say, how do I get myself under God's training grace. And so we started by seeing that by God's grace, he draws a sinner to himself. And through Jesus' finished work on the cross, he gives that person deliverance from the eternal penalty of their sin. We just looked at what Paul said about step two, where God's grace trains the newly saved person to put off the old sinful patterns and live a godly life. And that brings us to the third thing that God's grace does, does, which is found in verse 13. Let me read it, and then I'll tell you what it is. Paul says in verse 13, he says, Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Turn, if you would, to John 14. It's the last time I'll ask you to turn away from Titus 2. But I want to call this, and this is not a good theological term, I kind of made this up, but it fits. We talked about the saving grace of God. We talked about the training grace of God. I could call this either the sustaining grace of God, but I would like to call it the completion of grace. And you'll need to bear with me while I explain because it's going to take a few minutes. In John chapter 13, Jesus is talking to his followers. And he's been alluding to this for quite a while in his ministry, but he sits down with some of his closest followers and he says, we're soon going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed. He's going to be turned over to the Jews. He's going to be crucified and buried. And on the third day, he will rise again. He keeps telling his disciples these things over and over and over. And put yourself in their shoes. They don't want this, do they? Because they don't understand the full plan of God. And so they're distraught. They don't know how to respond to this. So John 14, Jesus ministers to that. And in verse 1, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions that could be translated dwelling places, like or individual homes. He says, if it were not so, I would have told you. Now, here's the important part. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, you can turn back to Titus chapter 2 if you want. You can keep pondering John 14 for a minute. But Jesus is here describing an event that the Bible calls the rapture of the church. And if you want to study it in depth, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. It's given in great detail right there, but I'm just going to give you a synopsis. Jesus is currently in heaven, and at the Father's command, and at the Father's perfect timing, which no man knows the day or hour, please keep that in mind. No man knows the day or hour. The Father's going to tell Jesus, go get your bride, and Jesus is going to ascend towards the earth. He is going to give a shout. There's going to be a trumpet. There's going to be a voice of the archangel And it says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. You're going to have to study that part on your own. But what I'm going to focus on is where Paul says, and those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord, and we will be with him forever. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. All right? This is the rapture of the church. 
And Paul, it was one of his favorite subjects. He loved talking about grace and he talked often about the rapture of the church. And here he brings it up again. And he says, you are living in this present age. You're living in the church age. And if you're like me, Saint, you're probably getting weary of how dark and ungodly the world is getting, right? And we're looking for solutions. And if you're looking for solutions in man's systems or anything like that, you are going to come up short all the time. Paul says there is one thing that's going to solve every problem you've ever had, and it's the rapture of the church. Jesus is coming back for his church, and while you're waiting, you might get weary. You might get tired of how dark and ungodly this world is, and you're not going to like the president, and you're not going to like the people in Senate, you're not going to like the people in Congress, you're not going to like anybody. Half the time, you're not going to like the people in your church anymore, because that's the spirit of the age. Everybody's just getting so grumpy in Jesus' name. Don't forget that part. And Paul says, it is the grace of God that is going to sustain you as, notice he says back here in Titus 2.13, as you are looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. He is coming back. And it's the grace of God that is going to sustain us to be able to hit the finish line running. We don't have to give in to what the world is doing, and we don't have to be discouraged by what the world is doing. We just keep plowing ahead in Jesus' name, and one day we're going to hit that finish line. And the Lord says a couple of things. He says, the blessed hope is not the next election. The blessed hope is not inflation decreasing. The blessed hope, notice, is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we need to be hoping in. And until then, there is a tendency for Christians to grow weary and well-doing. And Paul says it's the grace of God that sustains us to the finish line. And when the rapture of the church occurs, or for some of us in this room who don't live that long, it's a car accident, it's a disease, it's old age, whatever it is, we cross over from life on earth to life in heaven, grace is going to be completed. And whereas at salvation we were delivered from the eternal penalty of sin, then with training grace we are delivered from the daily power of sin. At the rapture of the church or at your death, you are going to be delivered from the very presence of sin. And you are going to live in the presence of your holy, righteous God and it is the grace of God that is going to first start that process, transform you, and bring you into the presence of God where there is no more sin, there is no more death, there is no more any of that. And it is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is our hope. And so Paul ends this. We come to our conclusion. We're going to just look at verse 15 here in a moment. But I want to remind you of the definition of God's grace. Please look back at the screen. We're talking about the merciful kindness by which God exerting his holy influence upon souls turns them to saving faith in Christ. I remember the moment it happened in my life, and I hope you do too. I remember the moment I heard the gospel and I said, I'm going to be saved by putting my faith in the finished work of Jesus. Do you? I hope you do. Then we talked today after saving grace that he keeps, he strengthens, he increases us in Christian faith, knowledge, and affections to the end that we would exercise Christian virtues. We talked about how training grace transforms us, and I hope it is, and I hope you are being transformed moment by moment into the image of God. At the rapture of the church, we're finally going to experience the completion of grace where we are talking about being completely delivered from the presence of sin. We won't wrestle with our flesh anymore. We won't wrestle with the devil tempting us anymore. We will be in the presence of the Lord where we won't be affected by sin. Isn't that going to be amazing? But to get there, we have to encounter moment by moment the sustaining power of God's grace. 
And Paul, very interesting, ends with verse, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 15. And it almost seems out of place. He says, speak. Last week we saw that that word means teach these things. So I've done that. We've taught these things today. But then he says, exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no one despise you. Now these words in verse 15 were directed towards Pastor Titus. He was pastoring a group of Christians whose beliefs were not impacting their behavior and Paul instructs him. He says, Titus, you can't just lead a Bible study. You've got to talk to two groups of people. The first, he says, you are to exhort them. They're the ones that are struggling. Remember last week that word exhort, it talks about a man going on a journey He's on his way to a destination, and he invites others to join him. So Paul says, Titus, you live this out in front of people, and then you invite people, especially those who are struggling, to, to join you on this journey. And I feel like that's what I've done this morning, by teaching this text the way I did. I'm inviting you to go on a journey that I've been on for over 30 years, and I hope that you're on this journey. If you're not, get on the journey. Be saved. Invite the Holy Spirit to begin transforming you. Be sustained moment by moment by God's grace because that trumpet's going to blow and you're going to look back and go, praise God that I hit the finish line running. But I want you to notice after exhorting, he says, rebuke with all authority and let no one despise you. Paul is saying, Pastor Titus, Pastor Randy, any man who stands in front of a congregation and teaches the word of God, you've got to talk to that other group of people in the church. Not the ones who are struggling, but the ones who believe that grace gives them a license to do anything they want to do. And he says, those are not the people that you say, hey, come on, come on a journey with me. Paul says, they've been invited time and time again. They've been invited to be saved to be transformed, to be sustained, and to just hope in the rapture of the church. Paul says there's people in the church and people who watch online church and they are playing church and they are thinking that the grace of God gives them license to just continue doing anything they want and Paul says rebuke them. Tell them very sharply that the way you are living, your faulty theology is going to lead you to a lifestyle of constant trouble and to an eternity that seems very, very insecure to the rest of us. There's nothing like doing a funeral service for a person that was walking with the Lord and on fire for Jesus. I, I love doing those because all I'm doing is I'm reminding everybody present, hey, they went on a trip. They got there ahead of us. They, they got their promotion before we did. And I know it's hard. We've lost them. But we can rejoice for them. They're seeing the face of Jesus. Wow. Do you know how hard it is when someone calls me and says, hey, so-and-so passed away, and we want you to do their memorial service? I'm like, you mean the person that, that you asked me to go talk to that didn't respond to the gospel, the person who you asked me to sit with when his marriage was in trouble, the person who, and that you want me to do their, oh, I'm on vacation that week. We'll have one of the elders do that service. It's the worst thing in the world to do the service of a person that you are not convinced was saved. It's horrible. And we just focus on the goodness and the grace of God. It is so hard for a pastor to know that there's people in the church that he pastors that are just playing church and, and they talk about the grace of God and the goodness of God, but you know that they are simply using words. And Paul says, pastor, rebuke that group of people. Warn them that they have no security in their life. It's why they have constant trouble and exhort them to receive Christ and be transformed and then to be sustained so that they, when they die or at the rapture of the church, can have the same confidence that the other saints have. So whatever group you're in today, I hope I got to exhort you. If you're in the wrong group, as I rebuked you, read again here. Don't despise Pastor Randy. You should actually thank me. I might have saved your life today. I might have saved your eternity. If the Lord is saying, hey, you're playing church, do something about it today. Don't just sit there and continue playing church. 
And so with that, we have finished chapter two and we go on to chapter three next week. But I wanna pray over this. I wanna pray over every one of us here. I wanna pray for those who are watching online. If this was not the clearest teaching on the grace of God, just so clear from the Apostle Paul, I don't know what was. God's grace saves us. God's grace transforms us. And God's grace sustains us until we are free from the presence of sin. Amen? And Father, we have dug deep into your word. And in these closing moments, Lord, as we're standing here in your presence, some of us have just been encouraged because we've walked with you long enough and deep enough to know that we are forgiven. We have been and are being transformed and we are sustained in the midst of this dark age that we live in. We're just waiting, anticipating, excitedly anticipating the rapture of the church. And when it happens, we're confident because of your grace and because of the finished work of Jesus, we will spend eternity in your presence. We're confident, Lord, that you'll continue to train us. We're confident that you'll give us the ability to hit the finish line because of the grace of God. There's others, Lord, and they may be in the room, they may be watching online. They're not feeling that same confidence right now, but they can. And it's as simple as just humbling themselves and saying, God, I love my sin more than I love you. I mean, I love you, God, and I love the grace of God. I love that you have forgiven me, but I still love my sin, and I, I don't say no to it. I say yes to it. I kind of flaunt it. I live in it. I feel horrible about it, but I'm not changing. I need to experience not just the saving grace of God, I need to experience the transforming, training grace of God. And then I'll begin to experience the sustaining grace of God that keeps me able to live in this dark, dark world until I see Jesus. To that end, work in my life today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.
your breath. 